Morning. Hello. If I can ask people to grab seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Pittsburgh into the Collective Intelligence Conference 2019. Uh, my name's Anita Woolley, and I'm one of the chairs of the conference. Um, and we're just delighted to have you all and are really excited about the program that we've put together that involves um, almost everybody who's here uh, in some way or another. And uh, we just look forward to the conversations, hopefully, that those presentations will generate. We have a bunch of thank yous, and those are going to be sprinkled throughout the day. Uh, but these first thank yous are, are personally intended also to alert you to the people who can help you uh, during the day. So we've had three people who have sort of, uh, you know, chaired some of our efforts um, in various parts of the program. Um, Pranav Gupta, you've probably gotten an email from Pranav at some point over the last couple of months. This is what he looks like. Um, and so he's been doing a great job helping us keep our um, web and media stuff updated. Um, Maria Tom Pru, who's been chairing our volunteers, and so there are a variety of student volunteers, and I'll, I'll show you who they are in a moment, who are around with a volunteer tag, so they will help you find things, um, get through locked doors, and stuff like that that might come up um, during the day. And then Patrick Carrington, who is our accessibility chair. So if we could please uh, recognize them with a round of applause for all their work today. <laughs> And then we have a number of student volunteers who are here bright and early this morning that I'd like to thank. And also just to, again, give you some recognition of who they are because they are going to be good resources for you um, throughout the day. So thank you very much, student volunteers as well. All right. So now I'd like to hand it over to my uh, wonderful co-chair, Nikki Kidder, so he can um, give you a little bit more information. Thanks, Anita. So welcome, everyone. Uh, and I'd like to just take a minute to thank our sponsors, without which this wouldn't have been possible. So uh, first, ACM and SIGCHI. <laughs> Apple. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> and then also Carnegie Mellon, which has made this beautiful space available to us. Okay, so collective intelligence has always been one of my favorite conferences. And while the problems we face in collective intelligence have always been important, I think today they're starting to become really urgent, right? So we're seeing fundamental challenges in the world that have rocked our collective intelligence about collective intelligence. And these are challenges to uh, making good decisions in the face of misinformation. These are challenges to the potential of traditional firms for leading us into a future of positive work. You know, these are challenges to innovating the scientific and technical solutions that we need to make progress on the wicked problems that we're facing today. And problems in how do we take AI, which is becoming such a powerful force, and make it a partner in collective intelligence, not just a replacement for human intelligence. And I think now more than ever, we need to come together, not just to understand, but to really define as researchers, what is the future of collective intelligence, which is quite literally the future of society. So I am really excited uh, about the program that we have here today uh, and tomorrow for discussing these issues. Uh, you're gonna get kind of a rapid fire uh, presentations from some of the best people in the world uh, about all of this, as well as some of the latest work that has happened. And to introduce that program, I'd like to bring up uh, our wonderful program chairs who've worked really hard on this. So please join me in a round of applause for them. All right, hi, my name is Andres Monroy Hernandez. And Melissa Valentine. <laughs> um, so we have, we're gonna go over the program for today. And then tomorrow we'll go over the program in the morning for tomorrow. Uh, we are going to start with a panel uh, that I will mod moderate, uh, focus on misinformation and collective intelligence. Uh, then that's going to be followed by uh, paper sessions. Uh, those are going to be upstairs uh, in these two rooms that you see there. Uh, and then uh, we're going to have Mary Gray uh, talk about ghost work, which is her new book that just came out uh, on the future of work. Um, and then we'll follow with uh, this plenary panel 
on wicked problems uh, on collective intelligence. Um, so following that, we'll have another plenary panel. So this one is about the future of work, but as Mary's talk is going to remind us, that doesn't mean we're not accountable for thinking about the present of work. Um, this is just all of us have done um, field studies recently. We have some data to present about how data is changing, how work is configured in organizations. Um, and then after that, we're going to have a poster session. You know how to do poster sessions. Here, Jesse, Jesse is demonstrating how to do a poster <laughs> session very nicely. Um, so I'm really excited about the posters that we have, so I want to just give a few shout-outs. So when you have the chance to go to the poster session, go learn about collaborative writing at scale, uh, five years of learning about innovation competitions, um, learn about mass reskilling, which is something that I don't know about. I'm excited about that poster. Um, so poster session at that point. Um, and so by then, you will have earned a banquet, and Anita and Nikki are going to tell us about the banquet. Okay, so um, when you come in for uh, the banquet, uh, which will be back in this room, um, you're going to actually be asked to sit at a particular table, So, um, which you'll get a chance to change later in the evening. So if you really were wanting to sit with some friends, don't worry. Um, but uh, this conference is about building bridges. And so Pittsburgh is a city full of bridges. Uh, and so we're going to have you build a particular bridge um, that unites the people at your table. So you'll get more details, and there are some fabulous prizes available. So uh, do make sure you come and join us for that. Uh, we have another very special treat for dinner. Uh, Hanu, uh, who is, uh, a sci among other things, a, a wonderful science fiction author, pro possibly my favorite living science fiction author, and someone I think is, uh, has written some of the most inspirational work around collective intelligence, uh, will be joining us, and he's created something new uh, to share with us just for this conference. So we're very excited uh, to see that. So uh, with that, we, we will, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy your day. We're going to move right into the first plenary session uh, on media and misinformation. All right, uh, so we'll start right in uh, with this panel. Uh, so I believe this conference started as a celebration of collective intelligence, uh, but in recent years we all have uh, seen some of the challenges and you know, witnessed uh, some painful counterexamples of collective intelligence uh, uh, through things like media manipulation, misinformation, and so on. Um, so this panel is gonna be focused on that, uh, on some of the information disorders that we've seen and how the collective intelligence could help address or in what ways collectives are responsible for these problems. Uh, so this panel convenes four experts on this topic. Uh, we're going to start with Tina uh, from Northwestern Uni Northeastern University, uh, followed by Emilio Ferrara from USC. Uh, then Moore is going to speak. Uh, he's coming from Cornell Tech. And then we'll have Britt Paris from Data and Society. Each of them will um, speak for about five minutes and then we'll uh, go into a discussion. Uh, we have some general topics that we are interested in discussing, but also um, I'm hoping that we together can you know, talk about this uh, and raise questions and comments that you have um, at that point. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna have Tina start. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me um, to come and speak with you. So this area is actually relatively new um, for me, and I'll describe how I got into it. So it seems like, at least for this panel, we're mainly going to talk about future of social media and misinformation. Perhaps we can touch upon some work that Duncan Watts has recently been doing about fake news and misinformation, and how perhaps it's not as uh, prevalent as we believe it is. Um, but uh, just the definition, misinformation, misleading information, right? Um, is it deliberate sometimes, right? Is it bad in all cases? It seems like yes. I mean, it's what uh, we uh, believe in. There's lots of uh, proposed interventions from normative, where there's regulations, to technical, like uh, automated fact-checking, to educational, we'll 
teach people how to um, sort through information to uh, a lot of uh, recent work from psychology and cognitive science in terms of nudging people to do the right work or boosting people in terms of inoculations or uh, technocognition. This is a phrase that my uh, colleague uh, Stephen Lomondowski has come up with where you're trying to make the user aware of how much attention they're paying to something uh, and uh, whether they are uh, doing anything, uh, any sort of uh, deliberative cognition. And so when Stephen came to me, oh, some of the, the uh, it didn't translate as well, that's okay. Um, when Stephen uh, mentioned this user uh, attention versus deliberative cognition, as a computer scientist, I automatically thought, oh, I have a two-dimensional space, right? Somewhere is where the prize is, and I want to go to that prize. And, uh, and if I am asleep, then I, am, I don't have any kind of deliberative cognition, and my user attention is zero. So when I put this up, and I was talking, uh, I'm part of this big project, I'll mention it next, uh, with psychologists, uh, they had a conniption. They were like, what? No, no, there's no way that you can get to that prize. But I think it's a good thing to discuss in terms of, you know, where we want human beings to be when they are, um, in terms of um, psychology and their cognition, when they are interacting with um, social media. And this leads me to this project that I'm on, which is funded by the Volkswagen Foundation, where uh, we're working with folks at Max Planck, with uh, folks in Bristol and us, and uh, I've highlighted uh, Ralph and uh, Stefan because they are the lead PIs on this. And so we have psychologists, economists, David Lazar, who's my colleague, computational social scientist. And we're trying to think and work on, in particularly, two things. One is design information architectures that uh, encourage deliberative cognition rather than capture users' attention. That's the whole thing with user attention versus deliberative cognition and how do you actually formulate it. The other one is design tools that boost people's ability to deploy deliberative cognition as opposed to this emotive reflex. Now, let's think about this emotive reflex. Um, does social media amplify latent uh, opinions, or is it a source of uh, persuasion between actors? Uh, I'm going to give you a minute to chuckle about persuasion between actors on social media. Um, but if the goal is, if the incentives of people who deliberately um, uh, create and spread misinformation is to increase polarization, then it seems like they care more about stoking this kind of latent tribalism that people have and not so much about persuading people that my side is right. And so if you think about this, so if I am uh, deliberately uh, propagating misinformation, creating and propagating it on social media to stoke latent tribalism, then what that could lead to is, uh, is believing in this false consensus, right? Uh, and this idea that I am the victim, right? There are people who believe there's a white genocide going on and that can then take you from your tribalism to polarization to radicalization to then perhaps legitimizing violence. And so this leads to this um, idea of perhaps as opposed to collective intelligence, there's also this notion of collective alienation, right? Where now through social media, the neo-Nazis here can connect to the neo-Nazis in New Zealand, in Greece, in Austria, so on and so forth, and feel that they are not on the margins. Uh, and feel that, oh, we are being victimized, and so on and so forth, right? And so it's an area that I think that this community should look into, right, this idea of collective alienation. On that note, I'm going to stop. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emilio Ferrara. Thanks, Tina, for the nice introduction to this problem. Uh, most of the work that I'm going to discuss today is out of our lab. These are the people who work hard to produce the, some of the results that are, I'm going to present, so they take most of the credit. Uh, with that, I want to say that I've, be, you know, I've become uh, kind of interested in this problem of understanding whether 
we can uh, determine if uh, an entity, an actor online in a social network, uh, in a social platform like Twitter or Facebook and so on, is a real human or rather a computer algorithm. Uh, quite a few years ago, and of course I wasn't the first person to think about this problem, obviously uh, all of you or most of you will be familiar with the notion of a uh, Turing test that was proposed uh, by Alan Turing uh, you know, in 1950s or so almost 70 years ago. And uh, nowadays, uh, the issue is that some of the platforms we uh, all participate in are populated by computer algorithms, bot, you know, bots that impersonate accounts and sometimes try to disguise themselves as uh, human users. So right about six or seven years ago, we started working on this problem of determining whether we could use uh, uh, a variety of signals uh, and uh, crunch these things, including sort of collective intelligence signals uh, information from the social network itself and uh, uh, crunch these signals into machine learning algorithms that would determine whether an account is controlled by a bot or by a human. Uh, so this work uh, uh, also in collaboration with my former colleagues at Indiana University, uh, we came up with this tool that is called Botometer. You can Google it, you will find it. It's uh, you know, open to everyone for use. Uh, that allows you to learn uh, some interesting things about human users and on the other hand, uh, users who are not humans on, on, on social media like uh, Twitter. So uh, alongside with that, what we wanted to understand was, and I apologize, the slide is not showing well in this, uh, in this uh, not, not widescreen format. Uh, alongside with that, what we did in a variety of different studies was uh, trying to understand what can we learn about how humans behave on these platforms versus how bots behave. If you take a look at the, uh, the paper that is uh, cited below, it's on communication at DSEM from three years ago or so, uh, there is a nice sort of interpretation of how simple features uh, that are a combination of metadata and uh, behavioral features can allow you to discriminate with uh, some uh, good amount of accuracy between human and bots accounts without the necessity to rely on complex machine learning, and machine learning algorithms. Um, so this was nice because uh, we uh, did uh, some amount of outreach and, and work uh, to inform the public that these entities populate the platforms. And this was right around uh, the time that the U.S. elections were coming up in uh, you know, the summer and the, and the fall of 2016. Uh, the work kind of got quite a good amount of attention and uh, I thought that was interesting because it has several implications. The problem that uh, our, uh, ourselves as, uh, as well as many other people and uh, many other researchers in the world pointed out is that these bots have been used in a variety of different malicious operations and uh, uh, they had some amount of success. There are you know, interesting stories about how bots have been used to manipulate the stock market uh, unfortunately, there are reports, including from insti you know, institutes, research institutes like Brookings and, and others, uh, uh, Data and Society and others as well, that showed how bots have been used by ISIS and other extremist groups to recruit Westerners and people and radicalize uh, people all over the world. Uh, everyone obviously is uh, uh, informed or aware about uh, the Russian interference campaigns in the election in 2016. There are reports of how bots have been used in that context too. So I think the nicest sort of output or implication of the work that we did was actually in the context of the 2016 election. This is one slide that points out to our work that was published. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot really see it right here in the slide. It's cut. However, the publication date of this work right here is November 7, 2016. So this is the day before the US election. So obviously this is a good faith report. We didn't know who was gonna win, but in this paper, if you read it, you will see that we highlight issues uh, associated with uh, interference operations and so on. This is the only peer reviewed paper that appeared before the election day that shows how bots have been playing a role in information diffusion and possible interference and manipulation with the election. And the take home message for this particular results is that uh, if you look, for example, at the amount of retweets or the frequency of retweets that uh, posts that have been tweeted from uh, uh, bots accounts, <coughs> and you compare that with the amounts of uh, retweets that human content generated, there is no significant difference. They are indistinguishable. In other words, humans, ourselves, retweeted 
other humans and bots at the same rate. And obviously this has uh, implications in things like the spread of fake news, right? There are many uh, um, uh, rationales and explanations of why that happens. They mostly rely in the, uh, in the signal theory, in the, the theory of uh, uh, costly uh, or costless signals. A retweet is a costless operation. It takes one click. It doesn't take, uh, you know, much effort. So people indiscriminately share this type of information regardless of whether the source was trusted, trusted or not. Uh, so I'm wrapping up just to say that there is a, a sort of a significant amount of research that went into this uh, domain over the last couple of years. And this work fortunately had some amount of uh, implications in the real world, in the outside world, uh, you know, beyond, beyond uh, academic uh, um, uh, boundaries. Uh, for example, there, is a, uh, uh, there are, you know, Senate testimonies uh, based on these uh, findings uh, in the context of the uh, Russian interference uh, investigation. There is a bill, a Senate bill that it's screenshotted right there, uh, that is called the Bot Accountability Act that uh, uh, has been proposed by Senator Dan, uh, Dan Feinstein, and this is based on the findings of our paper that is, you know, quoted right there in the second page of the, of the bill. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, uh, collective intelligence can be a powerful uh, source. It can be a force for good. It can also, unfortunately, be a force for bad. So it's uh, up to, you know, our community to figure out how to improve uh, the state of these, uh, you know, ecosystems, uh, hopefully coming up with some interesting solutions. And uh, I leave it to more who actually has some interesting ideas of how to do that. Thank you. Yeah. All right, now to the solution part. Uh, I'm not a bot. Uh, can you hear me in the back? I'm a little far from the mic, I guess. Uh, the, I'm going to say uh, maybe a few words about what uh, would be the properties of a solution, uh, but uh, I think far from suggesting one. Um, I'm going to suggest we learn from the animals. Uh, here's the, this is a flamboyant cuttlefish. Uh, you can find it off the coast of Australia. Uh, clearly a very brightly uh, colored fish. And the color is telling uh, predators around him, you know, don't even think about it. I'm so toxic. I don't even care if you can see me or not. We also have uh, the moose. Uh, the bull moose has a very large rack of antlers, and he's sending a signal that uh, said that I'm very strong. He's sending that signal to his uh, potential mates or uh, to the enemies. These uh, signals, both of them, uh, have been in the making now for billions of years uh, in uh, uh, in evolution, in the animal world, and extensively studied in biology is to understand how deception and cheating works or doesn't uh, always work in the animal uh, world. In particular, signaling theory uh, said that the signals are likely more likely to be honest when the cost of deception is greater than the benefits. I made a simple illustration uh, <laughs> of that. Uh, uh, so the, the, the moose, the antlers are heavy to carry, they handicap. Uh, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a way, and they, uh, the fact that they're uh, wasting so much energy, they're, uh, they're difficult, they're costly to fake, right? So if I'm an animal that's not as strong, I would not be carrying these antlers. Uh, the fish, if I'm a tasty, non-toxic uh, fish, I could uh, develop uh, the colors and mimic uh, the, the toxic uh, fish so the predators do not eat me. Uh, but eventually, they uh, will learn that we are cost, right? So they, they will learn that we be, uh, they learn that they, I can, they can actually uh, find and kill those fish. So um, uh, uh, they should avoid that as well. So the cost of these signals, the, uh, the risk or the handicap, led to a stable signaling environment, an equilibrium, where there could be some cheating, uh, but not too much. So overall, those signals are kept honest. This is obviously not the case in our current media and information ecosystem, right? The cost and the benefits are uh, misinformation are misaligned. There are clearly a lot of benefits uh, compared to minimal cost that it costs. Here's one uh, example that I think uh, Britt will touch on as well. 
this is the recent, now infamous uh, um, uh, video of Nancy Pelosi that had been slowed down to uh, seem like she was drunk uh, and spread over all of social media. Uh, the creator of that video, according to a uh, Daily Beast article, actually, uh, went through several iterations, trying to produce it, trying to distribute it in various Facebook groups that he already uh, owned that had a considerable number of followers. Eventually, one of them uh, cut on. Uh, thereby increasing his group's online profile, creating some revenue, and so forth. So really a lot of benefit for very minimal effort producing and distributing uh, this content, and almost no risk. The people who shared that video also had a lot of benefits and very little uh, cost. So they got social approval, uh, they, enforced, they reinforced their identity, they got uh, 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 likes, uh, they enforced their political views uh, and ideas, again, with no uh, consequences. And not even, uh, we don't even have to mention Emilio's bots that have, have an even lower cost uh, than uh, people in producing and sharing this information. So the media incentives are off, uh, the benefits are greater than the cost. Uh, the question is, can we adjust uh, the balance in any way that is useful? Uh, not solving the solution. I have some, uh, we have some evidence from the lab's work that uh, changing the incentives can change the behavior, and this is in an online experiment, as uh, I can see here. Uh, what we did in this study uh, is we showed people that we knew were either right uh, or left-wing uh, voters, uh, headlines that were either right or uh, left-leaning, uh, but we uh, change what, uh, what source the headline was attributed to, either uh, uh, left-wing source like the uh, New York Times or right-leaning source like uh, Fox News. And then uh, we asked them to evaluate whether they think uh, the, stories are, uh, the story is true or not. So the first question is interesting but not directly relevant to the topic today. We were wondering if people will be more swayed by an organization that aligns with them or a headline that uh, aligns with their uh, view. Uh, it turns out uh, I'm going to briefly uh, show here. The, the bottom right is the effect of source. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into these figures. Actually, I just tweeted a link to this uh, uh, paper preliminary work that you can find uh, on my Twitter account. Uh, but source almost had no effect. So people from the left in blue were uh, swayed by the New York Times uh, as much as people from the right uh, in red on the left. But uh, whether they aligned with the headline or not had a huge effect. So the left-leaning headlines, a lot of the left-leaning people thought they were true, and uh, vice versa. So in that case, motivated reasoning prevailed. When people had came in with their own viewpoint, obviously they were more, uh, uh, it was more agreeable regardless of who published that uh, information. But then uh, we were wondering if this was uh, everything that was going on. So we did another uh, study. We changed the incentives for the participant to be more uh, truthful. We gave them a little monetary reward. You can read the paper for the details. But what happened here, so I'm just copying this image from the left. Uh, it's the same, the same one on the right. But what happened after we gave them the incentives, it suddenly we saw people from the right and left much more willing to believe stories that did not agree, did not agree with their views. So, uh, uh, so all, the, all the, these bars uh, uh, went higher. So it's incentives that are misaligned uh, in our information ecosystem, but how to change them in real life is a different question. It will take more than just uh, a little mechanism. I can't imagine uh, Facebook giving money to people who are posting true information, who gets to decide what is true or not in the first place. Uh, so we will take uh, changing the assumption of our information environment, which we'll talk more about in the panel. Uh, it will uh, take change in the mechanisms, the community governments, and everything around it, including regulation and law, as Emilio just mentioned. Uh, in particular, we need, I think, collective intelligence. I think there's the right combination of people here in this room that think about the multi-level approaches that will uh, take everything from secure data storage and transmission and communication uh, to committee moderation, to legal uh, reform and regulation to actually make a dent at this uh, problem. But with all this, we need to remember that the cost has to be greater uh, than the benefit for us to find a trustworthy information ecosystem. Uh, that's my Twitter, we can find that data. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
So hi everyone, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, I'm Britt Paris, I'm from the Data and Society Research Institute, and I think uh, my few provocations here in the beginning will have, uh, it will echo a lot of what uh, everyone has said here, build upon it in maybe a, an unexpected way. I'm coming at this from uh, the sort of field of sociology of knowledge and the politics of evidence, so it'll be a little different, um, but I think there'll be some um, through threads that are very similar. So um, my work at Data and Society focuses on audiovisual disinformation. And I'm focusing particularly on um, videos that are faked. Um, and so I talk about that while popular discourse suggests that the dangers of audiovisual forgery requires new technologies of information security and verification, my work roots audiovisual evidence in a historical frame to argue that now as ever, uh, like many of you have said, solely technical solutions, well, I have a slide here for this, uh, solely, techno solely technical solutions will not solve the current problems that we are experiencing with audiovisual evidence, and indeed, solely technical solutions might exacerbate some of these problems. So, I suggest that the proliferation of these sort of AI-generated audiovisual fakes that we all know about, we've all been hearing so much about, deep fakes, uh, as well as the less sophisticated uh, fakes that I call cheap fakes that are produced through conventional methods of editing video with free software, that these both require more than technical solutions to address information vulnerability and verification. So the current phenomenon with audiovisual fakes also requires a very meaningful engagement with social, cultural, and even historical contexts of truth. And all of these entail thorny issues of understanding how mediated expression becomes evidence in nuanced scenarios online. So traditionally, the public imbued um, knowledge institutions, journalism, the courts, uh, the academy, museums, etc., they imbued these knowledge institutions with the power to shape discourse around audiovisual evidence. So every time a new audiovisual medium became decentralized, more people were able to produce and consume content, leveraging the collective intelligence, so to speak, uh, of the masses. And as content spread at new speeds and different scales, there were instances in which institutional controls over information were upset. And so there were instances of propaganda, of hoaxes, of forgeries, uh, that produce panic, unwarranted belief, and resignation in the face of pervasive falsehoods, um, even back then. That is, this happened until knowledge institutions were able to sort of promote convergence around a notion of the truth in the form of regulation, display and design features, or cultural norms. And this is all probably pretty intuitive and nothing new. I apologize for this slide, but I think it says something about uh, what we're dealing with here. So traditionally, the public... Um, or sorry, so at present we see how the collective intelligence applied to um, artificial intelligence generated uh, video production uh, using free apps like fake app uh, manifest online. And these benefit from the way that bodies are digitized, the way that voices are digitized, and the way that actions are digitized in today's online environs. Um, so that the first well-known instance of sophisticated video forgeries was pornographic, like many of these, um, and that the generalized term that we use to talk about these AI-generated videos now uh, is deepfakes, which originated from the handle of the person who, um, who was producing these types of pornography. This is all telling. And in addition, we know from the ways that these images and videos are already wielded online by amateur communities. We know that women people of color and those questioning powerful systems are the most likely to be negatively impacted. Um, so there are thousands of images of all of us online, in the cloud and on our devices. And this makes anyone with a social media profile, uh, or a public social media profile, or even a social media profile, fair game to be faked. And it takes just a few of these images to create a sort of convincing fake of any do anyone doing something that never happened. So the digitization of bodies is a problem to contend with because the scale and the speed of social media has amplified the volume and velocity of the visual falsehoods that we all have to interact with. You know, this is nothing surprising. We've been talking about it in the first uh, presentations. But it's not just, um, you know, this issue that we have 
new means of generating copies with, new origin or with no originals, uh, with deep fakes, it's that we have countless new channels for creating and distributing them. And in many of these cases, once these visual falsehoods are distributed, they are impossible to remove. So in these less publicized cases of sexualized video fakery targeting private individuals, expressive uses of technology that people are just sort of experimenting with the technology for fun uh, or, or some such, um, that these expressive uses of technology get leveraged as evidence um, as you know, the people that they target experience in some cases uh, diminish job prospects because the first thing you do is Google somebody whenever you know, you're looking to hire them and they see all of this uh, forged um, sexualized content. Um, this um, expressive use of technology gets leveraged as evidence as information travels through large social media networks. So understanding current examples um, makes clear that the problems that we're facing now don't result just from new sophisticated technologies themselves, but rather come from how these technologies are used and interpreted. <clears throat> and while platforms, well, yeah. So while platforms at present are calling for primarily technical solutions for audiovisual disinformation, um, I think this is a fine first step, or a step that's necessary to be complemented. Um, but we also have to remember that the notion of audiovisual truth does not fit easily into easily technical or easily verifiable or technical definitions. Instead, uh, these truths are culturally, socially, and historically sort of contingent. For the problems of the sexualized fake videos that result from the increasing dis digitization of bodies, we uh, or myself and a colleague of mine, Joan Donovan, um, in an upcoming report, have drawn from feminist legal scholars to discern between harmful and harmless uses of audiovisual manipulation. And we're looking not just at their intent, but also these videos' impact, um, and specifically these videos' impact on those who are not traditionally included in developing and decision-making around um, adjudicating what to do about new technologies. So I hope that understanding the contingencies of audiovisual truth and its effects will allow us to work towards a future in which power over information production and specifically distribution uh, can be meaningfully addressed and made actionable in a way that really serves and promotes the public interest. So those are the things that I'm thinking about. Thank you. All right, so I'll ask our speakers to come back. Um, so I want to start the discussion before we open it up for questions from the audience around the topic of incentives, which I think all of you touch a little bit upon. Um, and I guess one first thing is, you know, so we saw from Britt's presentation just now how some of these things have existed, like manipulation of images existed back even before Photoshop was available. Uh, and even with bots, you know, we have had spam bots for a long time. So what is it different about the new technologies and new platforms that makes this a bigger problem? Or is it a bigger problem? And I guess as Moore was talking about, like, you know, with spam, we have gotten better at detecting it and eliminating it. So why are, like, what, what are the differences between what we have today with social media or other new platforms and what we had before, even before email, but including email? You want to start, Emily? Um, I guess that uh, the interesting point here is uh, what kind of uh, incentive mechanism the actors behind uh, any of these uh, type of uh, uh, campaigns or operations respond to. So traditionally, and the, the nice example here is uh, the nice parallel. Is, the nice parallel here is with the spam. Uh, if you think about spam, spam is uh, predominantly economic incentives, right? So the spammers want to sell you something. They want to take money from you. If you think about scammers that operate using spam emails, that's the same. They want to take some money from you and so on, right? So they respond to financial incentives. If you make a defense system, it's an, ad it's an adversarial setting, right? So you have a defender and you have these attackers. If you make a defense system that is accurate enough to disincentivize the attackers making it more expensive and increasingly more expensive for them to carry out these attacks with some success rate, then, uh, you know, it's a, it's a game of cat and mouse, but eventually the defender will win because if you pour enough resources to put 
uh, the, the attackers out of business, then that's one uh, solution, right? Unfortunately, in the space that we have been uh, touching upon in the social media space and so on, some of the attackers, some of the uh, actors behind these uh, operations oftentimes do not necessarily respond to the same financial and economical incentives that we see in spam, in traditional email spam, right? So in the context of the things that I discussed when you have political interference campaigns, here you have sometimes very <clears throat> well-resourced, uh, you know, foreign actors, state actors and uh, non-state actors that have different incentives that they're not necessarily financial, right? Maybe they are looking at political or ideological uh, reasonings behind the type of operations that they do and they don't really care about the amount of resources that they put in because they have other types of benefits that they will gain from uh, carrying out these operations, even if they are losing money. So they don't respond to the same set of incentives, therefore it's harder to put them out of business. You need to come up with some solution that is maybe a mix of regulations and uh, technology and, uh, and something else that we haven't figured out yet. So I'm curious, Tina, so you've been thinking about information architecture, and you know, we heard from more on how we could change the architecture in some ways, both social and technical, to charge, or like, I don't know if you were going for charging money more, but like, it, it, to think about cost in some ways, to increase, in the, increase the cost for spreading information, maybe as a mechanism to, to reduce the likelihood of this sort of misinformation happening. Uh, what is your take on this from an information architecture perspective? Um, so the question is, uh, would people be willing to continue uh, on Twitter if Twitter were to, for example, charge f per tweet or something? I don't think so, right? So going back to your incentives, I think um, that Twitter likes the information architecture it has. Right, and it's all about engagement of people, and so it fosters the kind of bad behavior that we are seeing. Um, I don't know if we, for example, educate the public. The public will decide, okay, I don't want to be on Twitter anymore. Right? There was this campaign of people leaving Facebook after Cambridge Analytica, um, but I think. Um, it's kind of like the cat's out of the bag in a way. So I feel like it's just basically educating the public that like being cognizant of what you're trying to do. And that's why the work with the psychologists and the cognitive scientists um, to make people aware of what is going on, um, both in terms of education and also as you are interacting with information architecture. This is a little bit, so I didn't mean to suggest we need to charge uh, people. I don't think uh, that's uh, possible or viable, but I do think that uh, the very fundamental assumption of our current information architectures are just not, not clearly not working. So anything from just the basic information retrieval assumption that if information is out there, it should be retrieved. Uh, it's knowledge, right? This is what Google, this is what every single search out there is based on, that if I search for something, however uh, ridiculous or crazy it is, it should be retrieved. That's an assumption that continues to happen. It no longer maybe is uh, society, uh, supporting our society. The uh, ads, for example, uh, ads are optimized. If you do auctions based on ads, you pay less, the more uh, attractive or uh, the, the higher ad quality. What is ad quality? The more likely people are to to click on it. That works well if you sell shoes in a lower price than your competitor, but it doesn't work well if you're selling political information or misinformation or partisan information that is meant to uh, make people angry and, and is cheaper now to, to distribute. Uh, other, other such assumption, uh, uh, ranking of content based on uh, how partisan uh, it is or, or how engaging it is that causes more partisanship. Uh, so all these assumptions are uh, what our information architecture is like now, and all of them result in the outcomes that we see. Today. If I may just have a follow-up. Uh, so in my discussions with the uh, political scientists, one of the things that they told me was that, you know, previously the politicians were trying to go for the middle because that's where, where all the votes were. But now they're not going for the middle. They're going for their base, so which feeds this, uh, this feedback loop of the polarization of the bad behavior that we see both on TV and off TV and online as well, so. Yeah, I was just Is this working? Okay, yeah. Um, 
So I was just going to essentially, you know, sort of piggyback off what Moore was just saying, you know, the idea that the assumption of a lot of these Silicon Valley tech organizations is that, you know, all information is valuable and should be out there and, you know, sort of equally available as knowledge to the people. You know, this notion of, you know, it's sort of leveraging this uh, very commodified notion of collective intelligence at its core, right? Um, but I always think about, you know, what if we could think about information architecture in terms of, you know, disinformation and all of these things. Like, what about, what if we could make it or think about, uh, you know, making a, a, a post on Twitter or something like that, posting disinformation on Twitter, uh, as difficult and as tedious as, you know, going to the, the post office to mail, you know, like, you know, I don't know, some sort of spam or, you know, mailer or something like that. And I still think, you know, that's, that's something that people um, aren't talking about as much and might be a useful avenue to sort of direct this in. Like, what if it was difficult to post, um, you know, sort of bad information? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I think it could be difficult. It could also be risky. Uh, and I think you know, being uh, devoured by a predator is, uh, is a risk. Devoured by a predator also means maybe suspended by YouTube. So YouTube in particular, for example, recently has shown that they are willing to kind of maybe suspend accounts that have crossed uh, the line, uh, which, is, which is great, but they'll still serve, you know, with this breaking news event, maybe uh, 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 an active shooter event. They'll immediately post anyone's video to anyone else who's searching for, for the topic without any... Uh, filtering or any kind of idea of quality. So uh, those two can be balanced in a way, right? This, these assumptions of what to show and what to expose can be changed. And the risk associated with, po with posting uh, malformation uh, should be changed to change that equation. So I'm going to bring up censorship right. since this, uh, uh, you're right, usually at this point somebody says, oh, you guys are going for censorship. But from my perspective, um, it is not censorship, right? We're not trying to take away people's uh, freedom of speech. It's basically about what kind of norms do we want in our society and on uh, online behavior, right? Uh, we have norms, right? You didn't show up naked here, right? So, uh, and so what kind of normative behavior we want people to have in, in, on online and try to nudge them, boost them, or in whatever way allow them um, to follow those norms easily. So we are in a business school here, and I'm wondering if there are opportunities to think about what does the business model of some of these companies, the companies that rely on attention as the main mechanism for uh, getting money, so through advertisement, uh, Google, Facebook, including my own company where I work, uh, Snap, you know, we make money out of advertisement. And so the question is, do you feel that this business model is uh, impossible to reconcile with some of the ideas, like increasing the cost of participation uh, goes against, in some ways, this idea of you know monthly active users and more visibility of your content. And it even goes against some of the things that we, like 10 years ago, were excited about social media, like, oh, it's uh, uh, democratizing access to information. You know, I was very excited about like YouTube and how everybody was able to post things online. Even like I created our, our own... Um, you know, community for kids to produce content and put it online. That was part of the ethos of, like, more, better. Obviously, now we see that there's a challenge with that. But I wonder to what extent, you know, you have thought about, like, business models and how they are or not uh, possible to reconcile with some of these ideas. Go ahead. So I can try to address that with an anecdote. Uh, a few weeks back, I was, you know, attending another conference, and there was a keynote talk from uh, uh, the director of AI at, YouTube, I guess I can say it since it was uh, recorded, uh, and uh, it was about issues concerning uh, essentially misinformation and the spread of videos that uh, you know portray uh, things that are objectively uh, uh, mis misrepresented. You know the anti-science, anti-vaccines, all this kind of stuff, right? Uh, at some point, I brought up the notion of uh, essentially the business model of of, of YouTube essentially introducing these perverse incentives in some cases that drive the prevalence uh, of, of this content. Uh, and my question was, what are you doing specifically in the context of live streaming? We, the, you know, this event was unfortunately shortly after 
uh, one of the uh, shootings was you know televised on or or streamed on platforms like Facebook live stream and and, and YouTube and others right and uh, the answer was you know we are going to put a threshold so that you cannot live stream unless you have 100 followers followers or something like that and i said well what if this type of incentive becomes itself perverse what if someone says i'm going to make a shooting and live stream it if I get 100 followers or 1,000 followers, right? So I think that at some point, the business models of these companies and the way they, and the metrics that they create for evaluation of performance, engagement, and so on, itself becomes a mechanism to incentivize bad behavior. So my notion, my idea in this case, that maybe we need to rethink what are the metrics that... Uh, we as a society accept and think they are amenable to justifying, you know, the business model, right? So if instead of thinking about how many, you know, visualizations a YouTube video uh, carries, uh, if maybe advertisement itself would be based on the quality of the content and would pay more for co quality content as opposed to number of views, then maybe that would create a better incentive mechanism to, to, to disincentivize bad behaviors. Yeah, and um, to follow up on that, I think um, at this point it seems like uh, the business model is I just want user attention. I don't care what kind of user attention it is, and perhaps a sell would be that not all user attention is equal and that, you know, some are better than others, and if you promote uh, better behavior, you would get better user attention. And a lot of these... Um Social media companies that we've been talking with, you know, are like, well, we can't possibly change anything because, you know, the speed and the scale of these massive platforms, you know, we can't possibly, con you know, moderate content differently or, you know, sort of uh, incentivize content differently because, you know, the speed and the scale, it's already this way. And, you know, maybe if uh, these um, parties are sort of leveraging disinformation at speed and scale. Maybe these, you know, platforms should not exist at the speed and the scale that they currently do, by whatever means, you know. But a thought. Just uh, to add to that, but first, a proper disclosure: as of uh, next week, I will be at uh, Google for my sabbatical. Uh, so, just I'm not speaking for them. <laughs> like, I'll be a, uh, so. So this is. I'm still free, a free man, so I can say whatever I want. Uh, the, but I, I do think that it's, uh, the attention model doesn't help. Right? It's not, I don't think it will take it away. Misinformation will be solved, uh, but it certainly uh, doesn't help. Changing it will be a huge issue, so it's not, there are so many other constraints that are in place. So not only you know, Wall Street, and those companies cannot readily change their business model because Wall Street will not let them do that. There's too much uh, uh, stockholder power. Uh, that says keep growth, uh, keep adding uh, to the bottom line. Uh, in fact, uh, last week, if you saw, uh, there had been a lot of discussion of the pressures on YouTube and uh, Kevin Ruse had a great uh, piece in the New York Times, uh, not scientifically, but uh, claiming that uh, the, uh, uh, trying to increase the engagement by 1% on the YouTube uh, uh, website is what brought the recommendation system to the point where they're now um, recommending more and more extreme content as you watch. Uh, I think there's still room for studying that more scientifically and, and something that we're looking at, but, uh, but that argument directly says, okay, you know, business bottom line uh, trumps the consequences of what content is being suggested and how that impacts our information environment. But thirdly, we have to remember that there will be a political pressure, and there is political pressure uh, that prevents those companies from doing almost any changes, including policy changes that are not even technical. So I think that Moore is bringing up a really nice analogy with the way, for example, the stock, you know, with Wall Street, right? The stock market, it works in a, in a number of ways. There are things that you can do, things you cannot do, right? You cannot do insider trading, and that's not because maybe it doesn't generate money. It's because it's being regulated and it's being uh, forbidden, right? So one simple way that wouldn't maybe necessarily require a huge change in the incentive mechanism or the policies of these companies, would be, imagine that you have a system in which, by, for example, leveraging collective intelligence, uh, e people, users can flag content as, you know, inappropriate, such tools exist in many, many platforms already, uh, and then 
there would be sort of a semi-automatic maybe vouching of the quality of the content that is being flagged as potentially inappropriate and maybe with a human in the loop or maybe you know with some pre-filtering by using machine learning and so on one could determine that for example a particular video is not suitable anymore for displaying ads so the producer would be disincentivized from coming up with an anti-vaccine you know uh, video because people will immediately flag it and uh, you know YouTube would deactivate the ads on that video and the producer wouldn't make any money right so I think that some of these simple implementations that leverage uh, what I guess the majority what the collective thinks about a particular problem would maybe isolate the effect of fringe communities of course it's a trade-off because then things like censorship can uh, come up right so if there are enough people who would you know, want to fight that particular point of view, there would be an effort, an orchestrated effort to flag things as inappropriate or, 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 uh, or whatever, right? So there has to be some evaluation. That means there has to be some regulation, something that describes exactly uh, what is appropriate and what not on these platforms. I, I do want to open it up for uh, questions uh, or comments from the audience as well. In the meanwhile, Tina, you wanted to say? Yeah, just one thing. I think that... Given that we are in a business school, I think this is an area where uh, we should talk with and learn from marketing and advertising people, right? We're talking about user attention. Well, CNN wants people's user attention, right? Fox News wants it, right? The merge of news and entertainment. And for example, the latest Pelosi fake uh, video, right? It started in mainstream and then it went online, right? And so everybody wants to make money of that user attention and discussions with both experimental psychologists and marketing and advertising people in terms of what kind of society we want to live in and what kind of norms we want to have both online and offline is something that we should have. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Over here. Thanks. So I had a question about the sort of pressures from Wall Street being part of the rationale here, because uh, Google and Facebook and Snap especially went public, giving outside shareholders basically no rights. Zuckerberg controls 60% of the votes and selects the board of directors. Google, same deal with Sergey and Larry. Evan Spiegel has all the votes. Outside shareholders have zero votes. And so in what sense is sort of does Wall Street have the whip hand here? Like when the New York Times went public, they did the same thing, giving the founding family uh, eternal control through its voting rights. And the rationale was, we don't want to be subject to pressures from Wall Street. We don't want the New York Times to publish nonsense just because it will sell ads. So why are these companies structured in a way that give them the discretion to actually do the right thing, but they refuse to do it? Uh, there are a number of elements uh, uh, that I, and I can't really talk for any of the companies or the leadership, right? But one, uh, for example, consideration is the employees, right? Employee benefits are all tied to the stock. Uh, the stock needs to perform well. Uh, it doesn't matter who is in control. If the stock doesn't perform well, they won't be able to do their, their job, right, as, as a company. Uh, so there are many other, I think, more uh, indirect incentives that doesn't, uh, even, if they, even if they don't care about maximizing stockholder value, uh, which apparently, I don't, I don't know that they took it out of their equation. It's a very difficult, and, and I think those changes are not going to be, okay, you know, we're going to have a bad quarter. I mean, if they really want to change how ads work on Google or Facebook, uh, they, it's going to be a significant change to their uh, business model and a significant change to the bottom line that will last m multiple years. So it's, I don't think it's easy to do even when you have control. And any other questions, comments, people who are in business over there, this one, not or not in business? You, you want to grab the mic? And there was also a question behind, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, one way of attacking this, it would seem to me, would be to counterattack. And it would seem to me that um, that the... Uh, this is all propaganda issue, and we, you know, propaganda that we have centuries of propaganda, and the 
the people on the, quote, right side are not as good at it as the people on the, the wrong side. And we were just losing, just in volume and imagination. All propaganda does not appeal to reason. Almost everything I've heard here is about reason. I don't think what's on the internet is about reason. It's really about emotion. And, and the, 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 quote, bad guys are better at tapping emotions. And it's really, a, I think we need a call for people on the appropriate side, quote, <laughs> to uh, create material that will be as compelling and attract as much as attention. Just a comment. That's yeah, no, I definitely agree. And this is why I was mentioning the issues about are they going for your latent tribalism, right? Uh, are you one of us, right, kind of a thing. Um, so I agree with you on, on that point. So I think that the problem in itself is determining who are the people on the one side and who are the people on the other side, right? So if you think about these in a, in a way that you would, uh, would need to implement some sort of interventions. Who would be the one who counteract the misinformation, right? It depends on the domain. So some applications that I've been working on with people in, for example, the public health uh, sphere uh, involve uh, misinformation about, uh, you know, tobacco, cigarettes, e-cigarettes, uh, misinformation about vaccines and so on. On the other you know, side, there are the, you know, the bad guys who are maybe uh, motivated by, again, financial economic incentives. These are, you know, the big tobacco companies or uh, some, some activist groups. And all of these parties respond to different incentives, right? But on the side of the, you know, the right, the, the, the people who are, you know, in the right, who, who do you have? Uh, you know, we, we worked, for, we thought about working, for example, with the WHO. Right or uh, in in the United States with the NIH to come up with uh, you know possible campaigns of positive information, accurate information, and so on. But these things never take off because they require resources, they require a sort of a long-lasting efforts, etc. And uh, I think that point that you brought up that is actually interesting is how do you get enough involvement, resources, and commitment from the parties who would ensure that what is being what is that the bad information is being counteracted by good information i don't think there is still this understanding that uh, there uh, there is something real at stakes which warrants investing in the production of accurate uh, you know trustful information i think that's a big issue i think there are, there are a few just to comment on that uh uh, I think there are a few uh, things that uh, go against uh, the attempt to counter uh, the information the, or the emotional appeal of the misinformation in particular. Uh, one, that it's the cost of production, right? It's much easier to produce a fake emotional claim than it is to say uh, to produce uh, something that's based on reality. And the second is the, uh, the, uh, the open-endedness of the domain. I can come up with any fake claim, but I only have a limited number of perhaps uh, truism that I can post out there. So uh, the, the, uh, the other, our ecosystem again is uh, now, you know, it used to be that uh, the newspapers had, you know, page one was sensational and the rest of it didn't have to be that sensational. You were selling it based on the front page. Now, uh, newspapers are not packaged anymore, right? You're selling every single headline. And every one of those is optimized to be more uh, emotional, perhaps, or more attention-grabbing than, than the other, which creates a real imbalance. So everything is either terrible or not. I mean, this is why, you know, Huffington Post and the more partisan outlets, uh, Drudge, Breitbart, right? This is why they succeed, because they, they turn to the emotional. And by, defini by definition, they use the partisanship to do that. Uh, and that becomes even more and more extreme. I mean, I'm wearing socks today. I don't know if you can see from there. They say, uh, this meeting is bullshit. I, I don't mean that <laughs> this meeting. Generally, it's a general uh, purpose sock. Uh, they would not sell socks that said, this meeting is okay. Right? That's, uh, <laughs> that's not, not, not. So the reason here doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Good. This Pretty meeting is okay, by the way. That's, uh, I'll say also, with relation to this question, there have been a lot of studies that, you know, show that um, people share information not based on the factual content of whatever, you know, the information is, but rather how much it supports something they believe to be implicitly true. Um, 
And this happens on both sides. There have been, you know, a number of studies, you know, if we're talking about sides here, you know, on the right side and on the not, you know, the incorrect side, let's say. Um, but that, um, you know, in certain circles, this activity is much more, uh, let's say, prevalent and influential. Um, and this is the issue that, you know, that you're getting at. And I don't know that anybody's necessarily solved it, but... There have been a lot of studies in this. As a quick follow-up, believe it or not, there are studies that have tested whether if you give a counterfactual intervention to someone who has been exposed to, for example, a rumor or a misinformation piece, that actually reinforces the recall, recollecting the wrong information. So there is a nice study out of Stanford where they brought in people uh, they show them a bunch of, uh, you know, fake news articles, then they show them corrections, and then they brought them back a month or some amount of time later, and they asked, you know, what do you recall about this news, which w what was true and what was not? And the people were much more likely to, the people who were uh, exposed to the counterfactual, the real truth, were much more likely to recall the other side, the, you know, the, the fake yeah. story than the ones that were not uh, provided with, uh, with the counterfactual, with the correction. Exactly. So there are, yeah. very there are very counterintuitive effects to operations of a sort of a, a, a countering misinformation. It's not clear at all that doing that would actually fix the problem. Some argue that it would make it even worse. Right. And Francesca Tripodi at Data and Society has done a great... Uh, qualitative study on this, um, if you're interested. I believe there's a question by Mary over there. Can we give her the microphone? Hi, Mary Gray from Microsoft Research. Um, I'm just struck listening that it feels like um, fundamentally, in, in many ways the way we think about collective intelligence, it has a, a kind of adversarial uh, atomistic model that that's individual agents that aren't organized and we're kind of taking the the sum of their parts right that that's you know the power the wisdom of the crowd but within there there's sense that if um, that the, the the dark side of that is the, a certain kind of evilness of of individual agents and I'm kind of wondering if that's one of the challenges for for the for the discipline is to think this isn't just about information it's people communicating and in most cases, when people are communicating, they're trying to connect. So even with the notion of collective alienation, I hear that and I think for marginalized groups, being able to hustle together in safe space is quite galvanizing. So I'm, I'm just trying to think, how do we bring how social communication is and communication and the social exchanges we have online to the conversation here so that we don't start building with the assumption and really a starting point of it's all adversarial. We've, we've got to be more emotional than the other. Because I, I definitely feel like there's kind of a need for bringing back deliberative intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I completely agree that collective alienation can also be used for good. And it has been used for good, for example, in terms of civil rights, et cetera. Um, but then it all can also be used for, for nefarious reasons, right? Connecting um, um, the neo-Nazis and all those kinds of things. So I completely agree with you on that. Um, uh, from my perspective, it, it, it feels like uh, as individuals operating the society, we have to uh, take responsibility for how we behave. And perhaps the information architectures should be designed such that we take that responsibility, Right, we and and maybe this is, for example, I know there are laws in Germany and, and other places where, look, if you want to live in my in this society, we have certain norms that you have to follow, right? Um, and perhaps that's where we should spend more time on, and not so much like money, 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 right? Tina, you brought up something interesting uh, when your presentation uh, when you were talking about uh, the work that Duncan Watts was doing with. Um, like the role of traditional media in these problems. And it makes me wonder, and this could be a collective challenge for everyone, like is there a way we can assess to the extent to which some of these problems are, to what extent they're driven by, you know, the crowd on social media uh, uh, versus traditional media, or even like things like Breitbart and, you know, there are pseudo-traditional media. Um, and are there ways we can begin to quantify or to qualify these 
these things so that like we don't throw away all of social media just because we have some problems and maybe there's a lot of good like you know people who are in marginalized communities find each other there is social movements very small businesses that find their customers and so on so how do we uh, assess the value uh, and the benefits of this openness that we have today yeah so um i heard duncan uh, give a keynote at the network science um conference at, at netsci uh a couple of weeks ago and he has this uh new work uh that's under review in science now um talking about what is the news media diet of an american right uh, how much does an american consume news right in a day and they've been able to quantify it and that it's it, within their big data set that they had and that it's very small and in terms of the prevalence of fake news online or uh, by online i mean social media versus uh, mainstream media thank you for doing that Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, and that, uh, the, and that there's more of it on mainstream than on social media, and that perhaps, like we, per because we get funding, money again, uh, we we make more of a hype about fake news on social mm -hmm. media than on on mainstream media. And I'm sure that the paper will come out, and you can uh, read it for yourself soon. But that's what what. Um, Duncan's work said. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, more, and then we go to the question over there. More? Yeah, but very, I, I don't think that they cannot, uh, I think the counterfactual is hard. They cannot be easily uh, divided, right? So the, the, the way the media publishers, uh, official and unofficial now, is, uh, is hard to disentangle from the motivation that exists in distribution in social media. Uh, so, and I think that Duncan, they make a great point. I think the media organization, especially the ones that are doing well uh, should be responsible in the kind of topics that they cover and how they yeah. cover them. Uh, but Yeah, the, um, the other thing, um, just as a follow-up here, um, when my dad was getting his PhD back in the 60s in America, he would go home from his lab, he's an electrical engineer, to listen to Walter Cronkite, right? He was the most trusted man in America. There is no Walter Cronkite now. Right. And I think this is also why, you know, we have become even more tribal now than before, uh, because who do you trust? I trust people in my tribe. Right. And so um, and so this notion of trust, we didn't talk as, as much about it here, uh, but I think it's within the purview of this community um, to say, OK, who do I trust and, and can I boast um, the fact that I trust you? And so if I get something from you. Uh, I, I believe that you've done some due diligence on that. Over there. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Chris Tucci, I'm EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. And I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts about, I, I understand that fake news and misinformation is, is, is very important, and probably more important. <laughs> but I think there's kind of a fine line between that and sort of this amplification effect. Like I heard, it may be fake news in and of itself, that you know, for the presidential election of 2016, there were like there was a real video, like real thing that was like Muslims for Hillary, and then there was this sort of amplification to try and get it out there uh, to to many people as possible because it was actually going to polarize people just to see that video, right? So and and things like I thought there was a This American Life episode on the prohibition and how they were trying to m manipulate people's attitudes toward prohibition. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you had any thoughts about that, how that relates to the fake news aspect of this whole thing. So I can speak about one of uh, the research lines that we uh, pursued in the last couple of months. And we have a few papers and some interesting results in specifically in this direction. So we looked at the content that the Russian trolls produced during the, you know, in the run-up to the, to the 2016 election. And most of that content was actually not fake news, but was the type of things that you were pointing out. This was... Uh, a, uh, you know, supporting, first of all, both views. So it was not as much a, as an effort to push a particular view, but at the same time pushing a given view, portraying a particular social issue, and the opposite of that, and creating uh, division, social, you know, division on, on this particular issue. Uh, this was the this is this is uh, essentially the gist of the Russian interference operation on social media. It was not 
the, the core idea was not to support a specific party. Um, so just to be clear, we looked at the, all the content that these 2,700 accounts that the Senate Investigation Committee and Twitter uh, kind of uh, unequivocally associated with the Russian operation. We happened to have collected the content of these, that these users posted while we were running our own uh, data collection and investigation on the 2016 election. Uh, so this content happened to be there organically in the data that we collected while we were trying to understand the role of bots. And the operation, the, 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 the tactics and the strategies that the trolls, the Russian trolls, which were arguably humans, they were not necessarily automated uh, scripted accounts, did was radically different from what we saw in the bots. And the problem was, and one of the most important things here is that uh, some people try to attribute and associate a particular operation or a particular set of, a particular phenomenology, a particular uh, sort of body of evidence to one actor, while in reality we have no clue or even no evidence to say that it's only one actor. It's, we cannot say that it's only Russia. We cannot say that this entire sort of things that we observe was associated to one state actor or a foreign uh, you know, operation. It, it, it's very well possible, and that's my belief, that it's a constellation of different efforts that then somehow interact in a complex way one another and then maybe uh, contribute to different things. We see that you know, uh, maybe they play a role in the spread of fake news, but that was not maybe necessarily the most prevalent or the most impactful or influential type of things that happened. It had some effect. It's probably hard to quantify. Maybe it was small, maybe it was not that small. But there are other things that we observed, like these operations that had another effect. And then these add up in a sort of nonlinear, complex way. And they overall kind of uh, pollute the information ecosystems in, th in ways that we don't necessarily understand yet. So it's a, it's a, it's a complexity, it's a sophistication and the, the uh, you know, the uh, interplay between all these parties that make the problem so hard. It's not just one thing. One, one comment about that. The, the, I th I'm very worried about the, the partisanship and I'm very worried about the type of uh, uh, content and, and filter bubbles. I think the most, uh, if we look at our democracy, it's the, the two ideas, right? One is the shared, more or less shared uh, base of information and facts and some trust in those facts, and the other is accepting the legitimacy of the other, other set of opinions. And when we have more hyper-partisan content, and we have more filter bubbles, the danger is not just being more convinced in your own views, but actually not understanding how, for example, leaders are elected with other views that will then cause uh, resentment and even greater uh, issues, right? So, because you're not just, you don't know that there are people that... Uh, so I think that, that is as, as great a problem as misinformation easily. So my question is about uh, verified identities um, and misinformation. So I know on websites like Twitter, it's, it's fairly easy to create a fake account last time I checked. Um, but on websites like uh, Facebook, it's a lot more difficult. And so um, I'm wondering if, so on, on both of these platforms, on all social media platforms I know, you're allowed to share uh, kind of articles that come from sources that may not have a verified identity. So I'm wondering if there's any research or, or um, any ways in which verified identity from the sources, from the authors of articles, uh, may help with uh, stopping the spread of misinformation. So at least one recent uh, paper, uh, there are a couple of uh, papers specifically asking that question, this, for example, Twitter verified uh, status, which is a very unique uh, design instantiation of what you're proposing. Uh, uh, changes how people evaluate content, and there's very little evidence that it does, unfortunately. Uh, people misinterpret what it means, they don't really understand how that relates to the credibility of the content. It's not uh, an ideal world, it may be a slight uh, nudge. I think there's definitely more room for transparency in what, this, uh, uh, what the source of information is, uh, how identified, I mean, they do it on Airbnb, right? Airbnb is a great example because it's a very high trust situation. It's not this is about my identity or my political views. This is, I'm going to, you know, this host might murder me, right? Uh, so they provide some uh, tools without necessarily giving up the anonymity, but some anonymity still. Uh, they provide some tools to verify an identity that you at least know that there is a real human being that can be accountable for their action. 
uh, behind behind that information. So I think we're seeing kind of a slight move in the social media platforms towards that. Uh, I think they could do more. You know, YouTube, for example, if you want to post about a breaking news event, great, but give us a way to find you if something goes wrong. Right? You cannot perhaps maybe you can do it anonymously, but you can be tracked or you can be proven. Your identity can be proven if you're causing, uh, for example, public alarm. So we have time for two more questions. One Walter there, and then one over there. Yeah. First, Walter. Yeah, so uh, Walter Lasecki from the University of Michigan. Um, maybe just a, a high-level comment or our parting shot here. Um, going back to the idea that a lot of the platform's motivations for uh, enabling, or at least not um, appropriately disabling the uh, spread of a lot of this information, is uh, shareholder value. Presumably, Attention right now is not yet valuable in and of itself, right? It's valuable because somebody somewhere sells a washing machine, right? And it, you know, maybe a little bit of a glib model, but if uh, long-term uh, polarizing content and fake information and all this stuff is actually a better way to sell washing machines, right? Well, one, that's kind of scary, but that's a failure at a, a higher level, right? There's this meta failure of collective intelligence where the market mechanism itself is causing the problem. And if it's not, then we have this planning problem that comes out, right? We're not optimizing long-term because short-term, we're just selling as many uh, washing machines as we can today, and we're uh, going to you know, uh, all go down in the flames <laughs> as a result, right? So it's just this kind of interesting, maybe we're stuck in one of these classic paperclip factory style uh, universes, right? Where we sell a lot of washing machines, but at the cost of reality. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's absolutely right. You know, it's about what kind of society you want to live in versus money, capitalism, right? So th th there, there was an interesting thought that you brought up uh, at the beginning. I'm not sure I, I agree 100%, which was, you know, your, your, your hypothesis that uh, attention per se is not valuable. I think it's actually really valuable, this, you know, regardless of the, of the selling you the washing machine today. Because in some sense, if I have your attention, and today I can convince you to, that, you know, to buy a washing machine, maybe tomorrow, since I already have your attention, I can convince you, I don't know, to buy a gun. And you know, the day after tomorrow, I can convince you that your neighbor is your worst enemy, and maybe you have that gun and you should use it, right? So I think that there is an intrinsic value in the notion of attracting attention, which is somewhat, devoid of the, of the immediate sort of advertisement uh, 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 no, uh, idea, right? In fact, this was, I think, the, the reason why these operations from, uh, uh, you know, the Russian interference and other type of similar operations that do not necessarily have a financial uh, incentive system behind it, they are more tied to beliefs and uh, ideologies and so on, that's why they work. Yeah. And certainly as uh, we get closer to viewing whatever post-capitalism looks like, <laughs> right, it, that becomes more true because it is in some sense the only um, fundamental piece of democracy, right? If we're going to collectively agree that reality exists in the first place, I have to be able to communicate with somebody else who goes, yeah, that, that cup's really there. Um, and if I get that confirmation and you don't, well, that's all based on attention. Um, I just wonder if that's the actual mechanism that's in place right yeah. now. Because even thinking about votes as a commodity um, is something that, or stability as a commodity, is something that comes directly out of. But, but uh, also, user attention is not binary. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting yeah. you, but no, user no, attention is not binary. You were talking about you have my attention such that I actually put down money, right? That's very different than, you know, like you have like a split second of my attention here, I have like 100 people in front of me, right? So th it's not binary. We're running low on time, so I want to give an opportunity for the last question over there. You were raising your hand for a while. Um, can, can somebody give the mic? Yeah. Hi there. My question is, uh, to what degree, it seems to me that the problem of misinformation uh, may have been solved, at least on the individual level, over thousands of years in, this, in certain philosophical traditions, in the sense that uh, a re reliably having the opportunity Reliably being able to achieve our well-being doesn't necessarily believe, doesn't necessarily uh, hinge on the belief in any information or any other information. It hinges on uh, expanding our awareness of what is 
are expanding our understanding of what is true in our awareness. So the approach of looking at, uh, of putting control over our well-being externally uh, has never been reliable in achieving well-being. The approach of putting well-being in our, in our personal control has always been far, far more reliable. Uh, in terms of misinformation, uh, it may be very difficult to determine what is misinformation because what from one person may be a fan fiction story that is factually untrue is allegorically deeply true. Uh, cutting out some, someone's truth uh, for someone else's truth is necessarily putting things outside our internal control. My question is, uh, if that lesson can be replicated to collective reasoning processes, uh, is there some way that we can uh, assess the fitness of a certain belief in achieving our awareness as opposed to trying to block the information that comes in? We are running out of time, but maybe one person can say something quick. Tina, you had thought about education, and maybe that's a good segue to this. Um. Yeah, so I, I would agree uh, with what you said. The, the, the point is that uh, whether a, a piece of information directly affects me or not is a very high bar, right? Um, perhaps like a place to look at is in the anti-vaxxer campaign, right? Where now you have, like, I'm an anti-vaxxer, I don't vaccinate my kid, my kid gets measles and dies, and then do I attribute that to the misinformation that I got from the anti-vaxxers or somewhere else? And can I be convinced of that, right? In fact, this whole tie-in between uh, autism and vaccines is because, as I understand it, medical doctors can't diagnose autism until the kid is about two, right? And, it's the, and, and that's when you also get all these vaccines. And so this thing of correlation versus causation that people have a lot of trouble with. And so I think it's a very high bar, but I'm all for having people who can reason well and do critical thinking. Yeah, that's we're professors. That's five what we seconds want. more. Just one sentence that uh, just makes me think that uh, we we're talking about information systems that support a democracy. But I think at this age, there's also uh, Tom Malone in the book, uh, his uh, latest book, writes about how democracy is an act of collective intelligence. We could also think about changing our democracy uh, to, sub, to uh, uh, work well in the days where we have new information ecosystems. So that's not something that is a collective intelligence task. And with that, I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you. Okay, so very interesting conversations. Please continue the conversation outside for a short coffee break. Uh, after that, there are gonna be two parallel uh, paper sessions that are gonna be running upstairs. So you can follow the 